Welcome to Real Chemistry. Today we're going to be talking about thermal equilibrium. And basically what we're thinking about here is putting two objects into contact, one that's hot and one that's cold. And over the long run, the cold object will get warmer and the hot object will cool down. And eventually they'll approach the same temperature. What we're going to do in this video is first talk about what's going on at the molecular level during this process. And then we're going to do a practice problem where we actually go through all the steps you'd need to solve a thermal equilibrium problem that you'd likely see in a Gen Chem textbook. Okay, so first, what's going on here? Well, if you take a look at this picture below, we see all of these red spheres, which represent hot molecules, and they're shaking really fast. And we see these purple spheres, they represent cooler molecules, and they're shaking more slowly. Temperature turns out just to be the vibration of molecules, or whatever material you're dealing with. And over time, what happens is those fast shaking molecules run into the slower moving molecules and you transfer energy. So energy is transferred from hot to cold. And over the long run, what happens is they approach the same temperature and that's what thermal equilibrium is. It's the fact that when you put two objects into contact with each other, over the long run, they'll approach the same temperature. It might take some time, but eventually they'll be the same temperature. And we can express that mathematically by just saying the final temperature of the hot object is equal to the final temperature of that cold object. And we can see here in our picture that now those molecules are the same colors and they're gonna be vibrating at about the same rate. And that means they've reached the same temperature. So at thermal equilibrium, both objects are the same temperature. When we wanna solve problems using thermal equilibrium, we need to remember that the temperature of both objects that are in contact with each other will eventually be the same at thermal equilibrium. Lots of times it's just assumed that you'll know that in a problem. So remember, if you're dealing with two objects of different temperature that come into contact with each other, after a while, they'll be the same temperature. There's other equations we need to solve this problem. The next one I'll talk about is that basically the heat lost by the hot object is equal to negative the heat gained by the cold object. And we see that right here. So here we have Q hot, that's heat, is equal to negative Q cold. And all that's saying is however much heat energy the hot thing lost, that's how much heat energy the cold thing gained. And we have this negative sign because they have to be equal in magnitude but opposite in sign because one thing's getting hotter, gaining heat energy, one thing's getting colder, losing heat energy. The last equation we're going to need to solve thermal equilibrium problems is the heat capacity equation. If you're not familiar with heat capacity, go ahead and watch my video Introduction to Heat Capacities and then come back. Here we see that the heat gain or lost by something, that's this Q, is equal to its mass times the change in temperature times the heat capacity of that object, which is just a measure of how hard or easy it is to heat something up. Now, when we combine these three equations, we can solve problems that look like this. And this is a very typical problem you'd see in a Gen Chem textbook. This problem says a block of iron at 45 degrees Celsius is dropped into 302 grams of water at 21 degrees Celsius. After coming to thermal equilibrium, the temperature of the water is 22.2 degrees Celsius. What is the mass of the iron block? Now, if you've never, never done these types of problems before, it might sound strange that it lists a bunch of temperatures and then asks for the mass of the block. And that should tell you that it's going to be a problem involving heat capacity. And it mentions thermal equilibrium, which tells you it's a thermal equilibrium problem. So when you solve these problems, you can do it with the four steps I've outlined here below. So the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to write a list of our knowns and unknowns. So we're going to start out and we're just going to go through the knowns that we're given. And I'm going to divide them for water and for iron. So the very first thing it tells us is that we have a block of iron at 45 degrees Celsius. Now that's not telling us the change in temperature. That's telling us how hot the iron was at the beginning when it's first dropped into this cup of water. And so the way I'm going to express that is temperature with a little I that stands for initial. And then I'm going to put a comma with an FE there. So that's saying temperature initial of the iron, and that's equal to 45 degrees Celsius. All right, the next thing it tells us is that we have 302 grams of water. And so that's a mass. And so I'm going to put mass and then H2O. And we know that the mass of water is 302 grams. Okay. And it also tells us that that water, before it changes temperatures, is 201 degrees Celsius. So that is again telling us the temperature initial of water. So I'm going to put temperature initial of water is 22 degrees Celsius, or I'm sorry, 21 degrees Celsius. Now, 
It says after coming to thermal equilibrium, the temperature of the water is 22.2 degrees Celsius. So that is telling us the final temperature of the water. There's a temperature change going on because there's something hot and something cold. And the water, which was the cold thing, is getting warmer. It warms up from 21 degrees Celsius to 22 degrees Celsius. And that makes that number the temperature final. So I'm going to put Tf for water equals 22.2 degrees Celsius. Now, that turns out to be telling us something else too. Remember that things in thermal equilibrium are at the same temperature. So the, case, the, the fact of the matter is here is that our iron at the end of this process is the same temperature as the water. So we know the temperature final for iron as well. And it's exactly the same as the water at 22.2 degrees Celsius. Okay, so now it asks us for the mass of the iron block. So that's our unknown. We wanna know the mass of iron. Step one also says look up the heat capacities. And it's often the case that the CS, the specific heat capacity for your materials, isn't given in the problem. And what you have to do is you have to go look them up in your textbook or on Google. And I've written those down for us right here. So we have the heat capacity of water and the heat capacity of iron. Okay, step two says solve for delta T if possible. And that's what we're going to do next. Sometimes they ask you for delta T and that's what you're going to solve for at the end of the problem. But other times you can solve for delta T right away. And in this case, we have the temperature initial and temperature final for both of our materials. So we can calculate the change in temperature. Change in temperature is just how much the temperature changed. And we can do that mathematically as temperature final minus temperature initial. So for the water, that's equal to 22.2 degrees minus 21 degrees. And when we do that, we're gonna get out 1.2 degrees. So delta T for water is 1.2 degrees Celsius. Our iron, on the other hand, its change in temperature is equal to final, which is this guy, 22.2, minus initial, which is this guy, and notice that when we do final minus initial here, we're actually going to get out a negative number. And that makes sense. What that's telling us is that our iron got cooler. We get negative 22.8 degrees Celsius. And that's just telling us our iron dropped in temperature. So it's totally fine to get a negative change in temperature. It's never fine to have a negative mass or a negative heat capacity. So keep that in mind. All right. So now we've written our list of knowns and unknowns. Step three is really key here. It says set the heat capacity equations equal to each other. How do we do that? What do I even mean here? Well, remember that the heat lost by our hot thing is equal to the heat gained by our cold thing. And so let's separate out here all of our list of knowns from this algebra we're about to do. And we can say that Q hot, and in this case, the hot thing was the iron. So instead of hot, I'm just going to write iron. Q for iron is equal to negative Q for the cold thing. And in this case, the cold thing was water. Now, we have these two Qs set equal to each other. And what we can do is we can take our specific heat capacity equation from over here. And that's true for both our iron and for our water. So I can plug in M delta T times Cs anywhere I see Q. So that means that instead of writing Q for iron, I can write the mass of iron times the heat capacity for iron, times the change in temperature of iron, is all equal to negative, that's this negative sign that we're bringing down, there's a negative sign in front of our QH2O, and now we can write all these variables again for water. So it's equal to negative mass of water, times the heat capacity of water, times the change in temperature for water. All we're doing here is what's called substitution. We're saying, okay, I know that Q is equal to mass times change in temperature times heat capacity. I also know that the Q of my water is equal to the negative Q of my iron, and that just lets me plug all this stuff directly in. Notice now I have an equation here where I know the heat capacity of iron, the change in temperature of iron, the mass of water, the heat capacity of water, and the change in temperature of water. The only thing I don't know is the mass of iron. And that's in fact what I want to find out. 
So I'm all set here to solve my problem. I have all those variables above, and now I have an equation that can solve this for us. So writing down this equation is really the key step to doing thermal equilibrium problems. And in some cases, it might just be a good idea to memorize that equation. It's also good to understand this algebra. All right, so we wanna solve for mass of iron. So how are we gonna do that? Well, this is just an algebra step. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna divide both sides by CS Fe times delta T Fe. And when we do that, when we do that, this cancels out here. And what we're left with is our final equation, which is mass of iron is equal to negative mass of water times heat capacity of water times the change in temperature of water, all divided by our heat capacity of iron times our change in temperature of iron. So that's our final equation for mass. And now all we have to do is go in, plug our variables in one at a time. And so our mass of our water, recall, is 302 grams. The heat capacity for water is 4.18 joules per grams degrees Celsius. Our change in temperature of water is 1.2 degrees Celsius. That's all over our heat capacity for iron, which is 0 0.45, times our change in temperature for iron, which remember is a negative number, negative 22.8 degrees Celsius. So that means that down here we have a negative 22.8 degrees Celsius. That means that our negative signs, which are right here and right here, are gonna cancel out and we're gonna get a positive number. And that's good because we know our mass must be positive. So the mass of our iron is equal to this and when we plug it into our calculator and we round to two sig figs, we'll get 150 grams of iron. So that's the mass of that iron block. So what we've done here is we've used thermal equilibrium and our heat capacity equation to solve for the mass of an iron block that's been placed into water. So basically what that means is if I put two objects in contact with each other and I record the temperature changes, I can actually calculate the mass of one of those objects. So there's all sorts of problems you can solve with these thermal equilibrium equations. This is just one example of a practice problem. So if you still have questions or you have slight variations on these problems and you're not sure how to solve them, please ask them below. Also, if you enjoyed this video and it was helpful to you, go ahead and subscribe to Real Chemistry. Thanks for watching.